Hi all, today I'll be going over the concepts in Hurley's Intro to Logic, Section 1.2, Recognizing Arguments. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is first I'm going to talk about some of the qualities of arguments that will help us distinguish arguments from non-arguments. Then I'll go over the different types of non-arguments uh, one by one, talking about why they're not arguments, how we can recognize that they're not arguments. Uh, I'll go over some passages after I talk about each type of non-argument. I'll go over some passages and we'll uh, try to figure out if those passages are arguments or non-arguments. And then finally, there'll be three passages uh, for the quiz questions. So let's get started. So we should recall, if a passage is an argument, then it must have what we call inferential content. Inferential content uh, means that there has to be a claim that one statement provides a reason or evidence for another statement. And there has to be another claim, a claim that something follows from the reasons or evidence. We recall that the statements that provide reasons are premises and the statements that uh, that the reasons are trying to prove is the conclusion. So there has to be a premise and there has to be a conclusion. There has to be a link between them. We call it uh, an inferential link. Uh, so arguments have inferential content. Now, the claims, the claim that uh, some of the information follows from some of the other information that can be explicit or implicit. So explicit meaning stated. And if it's going to be, if the inferential link is stated, then it would use indicator words. So, uh, if the argument says since A, therefore X, then, uh, that inferential link would be explicit. The passage would be telling us explicitly that A was supporting X in that example. Or the, the logical link can be implicit. It would lack the indicator words, but something about the order of the statements or the content of the ideas would tell us that there is a relationship of support between premise and conclusion. Now, a key point here is if there's no inferential content, so if there's no logical structure to the information, if there's no uh, relationship of support between the information, then there can be no argument. So we'll go through each of these types of non-arguments and we'll show how there's no inferential content. No idea is supporting another idea. Um, that's how we'll distinguish between arguments and non-arguments. So let's look at the first type of non-argument. First type is warnings. So a warning is a form of expression that's intended to put someone on guard against a dangerous or detrimental situation. Take, for example, this very short passage, watch out that you don't slip on the ice. We recall from uh, 1.1 that arguments are composed of statements, right? So statements have to have the ability to be either true or false, or they can be either true or false. And we also recall that commands are not statements. They can't be either true or false. An example is this statement, this uh, command, right? Watch out that you don't slip on the ice. So that's a warning. Watch out, don't slip on the ice. It's also a command. So it can't be true or false. So we don't even have a single statement here. Recall that in order to have an argument, we need multiple statements. We need at least one premise and we need a conclusion. Here, we don't even have one statement, so we certainly can't have an argument. We definitely don't have an inferential link between premise and conclusion. The same is true of the next example. Whatever you do, don't bet on anyone except the Warriors to win the 2018 NBA championship. Again, this is a command. Don't bet on anyone except the Warriors. Uh, and again, there's no statement here. Nothing can be true or false. Uh, the sentence can't be true or false. So we, since we don't even have one statement and we need at least two to have an argument, we definitely don't have an argument here. So warnings will uh, be pretty easy to uh, figure out that they're non-arguments. So let's look at the second kind. Non-argument, the second kind is advice. 
So advice is a form of expression that makes a recommendation about some future decision or course of conduct. Let's look at the first passage. You should keep a few things in mind before buying a used car. Test drive the car at varying speeds and conditions, examine the oil in the crankcase, ask to see service records, and if possible, have the engine and powertrain checked by a mechanic. Now, there are a few, uh, there's at least one statement here. So you should keep a few things in mind before buying a used car. That's a statement, right? But then we get the other sentence here. The other sentence here gives you a couple of commands. Test drive the car at varying speeds and conditions, examine the oil in the crankcase, ask to see service records, and if possible, have the engine and powertrain checked by a mechanic. So here we have only one statement. You should keep a few things in mind before buying a used car. Again, we need at least two statements to be an argument. To see maybe a little bit more clearly how this isn't an argument, let's think about how we could support the statement you should keep a few things in mind before buying a used car. If we wanted to provide an argument for that, we might say things like, if you don't keep a few things in mind before buying a used car, then uh, your car is likely to break down, and you certainly don't want your car to break down, so therefore you should keep a few things in mind before buying a used car. But this doesn't say that. It says keep a few things in mind, and then it tells you keep this thing in mind, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. So that's just uh, uh, a whole bunch of advice. Consider the next passage. Before accepting a job after class hours, I would suggest that you give careful consideration to your course load. Will you have sufficient time to prepare for classes and tests? And will the job produce an excessive drain on your energies? Again, this is just a piece of advice. Not, uh, there isn't an argument here. We can see that again because, again, we have only one statement. I would suggest that you give careful consideration to your course load. Now, that's either true or false. Um, but the question after that, that's not going to be a statement, right? Will you have sufficient time to prepare for classes and tests? And will the job produce an excessive drain on your energy? So again, we only have one statement here, so we can't have an argument. And here, again, uh, it's just offering advice. So if we were going to provide an argument for the statement, uh, you should give careful consideration to your course load before accepting a job after class hours. We might say something like people who don't do this uh, tend to struggle with their classes. You don't want to struggle with your classes, so therefore you should carefully consider your course load. But that's not what this passage says. It just continues to give more advice, right? So the third type of non-argument, statements of belief. So a statement of belief is an expression about what someone happens to believe or think about something. Take this passage for example. We believe that our company must develop and produce outstanding products that will perform a great service or fulfill a need for our customers. We believe that our business must be run at an adequate profit and that the services and products we offer must be better than those offered by competitors. So note the author here. We do have some statements here, but the statements here are about what a person believes, right? Not uh, so that somebody believes this stuff could be true or false without the, the statement that, the, that it contains being true or false. Um, so this is just a couple statements of belief. We believe one thing, that our company must develop and produce outstanding products, blah, blah, blah. And we believe another thing, that our business must be run at an adequate profit. And we believe another thing, that the services and products we offer must be better than those offered by competitors. Now, each one of the, none of those statements give us reason to believe any of the other statements. So since we don't, again, since we don't have that inferential link between information, we can figure out that there's no argument here. These are just statements of things that a company believes, right? Without any of them providing reason to believe any of the others. The fourth kind of non-argument is loosely associated statements. So here's one from Lao Tzu. 
Not to honor men of worth will keep the people from contention. Not to value goods that are hard to come by will keep them from theft. Not to display what is desirable will keep them from being unsettled of mind. So here Lao Tzu is talking about ways you can treat people and how they'll react. Um, so three different strategies you might try for treating people and three different ways that they'll react. They're loosely associated in that they're all ways that a ruler could treat uh, his or her people, um, but one doesn't give us any reason to believe another, right? So again, there's a lack of the inferential link. There are no there's no premise here and there's no conclusion. It's just three different ways that people may treat it and three different ways that they might react from them. Another type of non-argument is a report. So a report is a group of statements that convey information about some topic or event. So you might see there are all kinds of reports on the news, right? For example, witnesses said they heard a loud crack before the balcony gave way at a popular night spot, dropping dozens of screaming people 14 feet. At least 80 people were injured at the Diamond Horseshoe Casino when they fell onto broken glass and splintered wood. Investigators are waiting for an engineer's report on the deck's occupancy load. So this report is just a series of events. Um, none of these statements, there are multiple statements here, right? So witnesses said they heard something, at least 80 people were injured, and investigators are waiting for an engineer report. So we have three statements, but we don't have any, one. Each, none of the statements give us reason to believe any of the other st statements. So again, no inferential link here. Now, something you want to be careful about reports. Some reports actually contain arguments, but they're still, for purposes of tests and on the homework, ultimately reports. So if I gave a report about an argument Lucretius gave, I could say Lucretius said that um, we should not fear death because death causes no pain, and we should not fear that which doesn't cause any pain. What I just gave you was a report, a report on Lucretius's argument, right? The report contains that argument that we shouldn't fear death, but what I, if I gave you that entire passage uh, on the test or on the homework, you would say that's a report because I said I'm talking about what Lucretius said, right? I'm reporting on things that he said. Next kind of non-argument is Expository passages. So expository passages, an expository passage is a kind of discourse that begins with a topic sentence followed by one or more sentences that develop the topic sentence, that expound upon the topic sentence, right? So here's an example. There are three familiar states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. Solid objects ordinarily maintain their shape and volume regardless of their location. A liquid occupies a definite volume but assumes the shape of the occupied portion of its container. A gas maintains neither its shape nor volume. It expands to fill completely whatever container it is in. So the first sentence of this passage tells us there are three familiar states of matter. And then the following sentences go on to tell us about each of those. So there's a topic sentence here for expository passages. There are topic sentences. And then the rest of the passage will tell us a little bit more, go more into depth about that topic sentence. Now note in this passage, like other expository passages, the following sentences are not trying to prove to us that there are three familiar states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. That would be kind of a weird thing to try to prove. It's just giving us more in-depth information about each of them. So telling us what a solid is, what a liquid is, and what a gas is, what properties they have. Another type of non-argument is an illustration. An illustration is an expression involving one or more examples that is intended to show what something means or how it is done. One tricky feature of illustrations is they can have indicator words which might trick you into thinking that there's an argument, but um, again, the differentiating feature between an illustration and an argument will be that inferential link. Does some of the information support any of the other information in a way that's trying to prove it? 
right? So take this passage, for example. A deciduous tree is any tree that loses its leaves during the winter. For example, maples are deciduous, and so are elms, poplars, hawthorns, and alders. So if there was going to be a conclusion here, it would probably be the first sentence. A deciduous tree is any tree that loses its leaves during the winter. But then we might ask ourselves, how would we try to prove that a deciduous tree is any true tree that loses its leaves during the winter? We could like point at a dictionary definition, like here's a dictionary and this is what it says about a deciduous tree. That's how we know that this is the definition of a deciduous tree. But that's not what the rest of the passage does. The rest of the pa passage just gives us examples of different kinds of deciduous trees. So maples, elms, poplars, hawthorns, and alders. The fact that those are all deciduous trees doesn't give us evidence that a deciduous tree is any tree that loses its leaves during the winter. It just gives us examples. It illustrates, uh, points to examples of, uh, what a deci of deciduous trees. So illustrations look for examples. If you see four examples, strongly suspect that what you're looking at is an illustration. All right, uh, the next type of non-argument is an explanation. So an explanation is an expression that is an attempt to shed light on some event or phenomena. Some difficulties distinguishing explanations from arguments, they have parts and they often have indicator words, especially the word because. Um, but let's look at some examples and talk about how explanations are importantly different from arguments. So here's an example. The sky appears blue from the Earth's surface because light rays from the sun are scattered by particles in the atmosphere. So we see that indicator word because, and because we know from the last uh, section is a premise indicator, if there's an argument. Um, so then we would think, if we thought this was an argument, we would think light rays from the sun are scattered by particles in the atmosphere is the premise, and the sky appears blue from the Earth's surface would be the conclusion. But the way arguments work is arguments try to prove statements that are fairly controversial with reference to facts that are more or less accepted, right? So premises, arguments move from certainty to a less certain, to try to prove a less certain conclusion. If the conclusion here is the sky appears blue from the Earth's surface, that would be a really funny thing to try to prove to people because that's immediately obvious, right? We look up at the sky, we see it appears blue from the Earth's surface. So the, what we thought was a premise isn't trying to prove that the sky appears blue from the Earth's surface. For that, we would only need to say, hey, look up at the sky, it looks blue. Therefore, the sky appears blue from the Earth's surface, right? But here we get an explanation of why it looks blue from the Earth's surface. So why does it look blue? It looks blue because light rays from the sun are scattered by particles in the atmosphere. So a good test for whether or not the passage you're looking at is an explanation or an argument is ask yourself what the, conclu what you, what the conclusion would be if it was an argument, and then ask yourself if it's at all controversial. Um, if it's not at all controversial, then you're probably looking at an explanation. Take the next example. Golf balls have a dimpled surface because the dimples reduce air drag, causing the ball to travel farther. Now again, the conclusion here would be golf balls have a dimpled surface, but that's again immediately obvious. You can just look at a golf ball and see that it has a dimpled surface. If somebody was going to try to prove this, if this was controversial, then maybe you were trying to argue with somebody who had never seen a golf ball, and you would be trying to argue that they have a dimpled surface, and you would maybe show them different pictures. Look at this picture of a golf ball. It has a dimpled surface. Look at that video. The golf ball has a dimpled surface. Therefore, golf balls have a dimpled surface. But the rest of the passage gives you an explanation for why it has a dimpled surface because they reduce, reduce air drag and cause the ball to travel farther. So that explains why it doesn't try to prove that golf balls have a dimpled surface. Next passage is similar. Navel oranges are called by that name because they have a growth that resembles a human navel on the end opposite the stem. 
Now again, we have that word because. You'll very frequently see that in explanations. Um, so if this was an argument, then what came after the because would be the premise. They have a growth that resembles a human navel on the end opposite the stem, and the conclusion would be navel oranges are called by that name. But then we would look at the conclusion and ask ourselves, is that what I take to be the conclusion at all controversial? Navel oranges are called by that name. So essentially, navel oranges are called navel oranges would be our conclusion. I can't think of anything less controversial than that. Uh, so this definitely cannot be an argument. It's got to be an explanation explaining why navel oranges are called navel oranges because of the resemblance to a human navel. All right, so just like arguments have premises and conclusions, explanations also have parts. The part that's being explained, we call the explanandum. The explanandum, so that's the, the sentence that's being explained or the statement that's being explained. And the explanands is the statement that's doing the explaining. So if we go back up to our three examples, uh, we saw that the explanandum happened to occur first in these examples, so the sky appears blue from the Earth's surface. That's what's being explained, so that's the explanandum. And then the explanands, the thing that does the explaining in that example, is light rays from the sun are scattered by particles in the atmosphere. New terminology, and you'll need to know it. So the notes for how we distinguish between explanations and the arguments here are at the bottom. Arguments attempt to prove conclusions with reference to accepted facts. So they go from certainty to try to, or relative certainty, accepted facts, to try to prove a controversial conclusion. An explanation attempts to show how an accepted fact is true, uh, tries to explain how it's true or why it's the case and ask if the possible conclusion is controversial to, uh, to ultimately determine whether it's an explanation or argument. All right, the final type of non-argument that the chapter, that the section covers is our conditional statements. Conditional statements are just simply if-then statements. Now, they have parts and they can have the indicator words, so it can be a little confusing but uh, hopefully not too much. So let's look at the first example. If professional football games incite violence in the home, then the widespread approval given to the sport should be reconsidered. So here we just have one if-then statement, right? So we have one statement, so we definitely can't have an argument. Uh, but let's talk about why we should consider this as one statement instead of two separate statements. So, argument in an argument, there's a claim that the premises are true, and the truth of the premises, it gives us a reason to believe the truth of the conclusion. But in conditional statements, there's no claim that the premise is act, that the first part, that the if statement is true, nor a claim that the then statement is actually true. There's just a claim that if the first part, then the second part. So it's unlike an argument in that way, where the premises are claimed to be true and the truth of the premises are supposed to support the truth of the conclusion. So this just tells us that if professional football games incite violence in the home, if that happens to be the case, then what would follow from that? Well, then what would follow from that would be the widespread approval given to this sport should be reconsidered. But there's no claim that that first part is true, nor that the second part is true. If this were to be an argument, we'd have to take out the if-then phrasing, and it would just read like this. Since professional football games incite violence in the home, therefore the widespread approval given to the sport should be reconsidered. That would be an argument because there'd be a claim that, uh, that the premise was true and a claim that it led to the conclusion. With conditional statements, there isn't that claim. So get the second one. If Roger Federer has won more Grand Slams than any other contender, then he rightly deserves the title of world's greatest tennis player. Again, there is no claim that he has won more Grand Slams than any other contender, nor that he rightfully deserves the title of world's greatest tennis player, but if he had won them, then he would deserve the title. 
Now, single conditional statements by themselves, like the kind we got, uh, like the first two examples, those were single conditional statements, they can't be entire arguments because they're only one conditional statement. And when we have one statement, we can't have an argument because we need at least two statements. But conditional statements can play a role in arguments. They can play the role of either premises or the conclusion. So let's look at the third example here. If you go to foreign films, if you go to documentaries, if you go to independent films, if you go to good films, you will become a better person because you will understand human nature better. Movies record human nature in a better way than any other art form, that's for sure. So here we have a fairly long conditional statement with a whole bunch of if parts and one then part. The if parts, so you go to foreign films, you go to documentaries, you go to independent films, you go to good films, all those are the if parts of the statement. And we get the then part, you will become a better person. And then we get that word because. So we recall because is often a premise indicator word. Uh, so you will understand human nature better. And then we get another premise. Movies record human nature in a better way than any other art form. So those are actually two premises which give us reason to believe that if you go to all those types of films, you will become a better person. What gives us reason to believe that? You'll understand human nature better, and movies record human nature in a better way than any other art form. So the conditional statement here plays a role, specifically the role of a conclusion in this argument. So single conditional statements cannot be arguments, no matter how long those conditional statements are. But conditional statements can play a role in arguments as either premises or conclusions. All right, so now we need to talk about the parts of conditional statements. So the parts of arguments, premises, and conclusions. Recall that the parts of explanations, explanons, and explanandum. Now the parts of conditional statements. So the part that comes after the if of a conditional statement we call an antecedent. The part that comes after the then we call the consequent. So let's look back up at our conditional statements. So the first one, if professional football games incite violence in the home, the antecedent would be from the word professional all the way to the word home. So the part that comes after the if all the way up to the, to the then. And then the consequent would be the widespread approval given to the sport should be reconsidered. We look at the second example, the antecedent would be Roger Federer has won more Grand Slams than any other contender. The consequent would be he rightly deserves the title of world's greatest tennis player. If we look at the, uh, at the conditional statement contained in the third example, then we would see that the antecedent, all those if, all those if parts, and then the consequent would be you will become a better person. So, the antecedent here is you go to foreign films, and you go to documentaries, and you go to independent films, and you go to good films. All those would be antecedents, and the consequent here would be you will become a better person. All right, so now we need to talk about necessary and sufficient conditions. So the antecedent of a conditional statement is a sufficient condition for the consequent, and the consequent is a what we call a necessary condition for the antecedent. So sufficient is a big word, just meaning enough, right? So if we knew that the antecedent of a conditional statement was true, then that would be enough to know if the whole statement was true and the antecedent was true. That Knowing the antecedent was true would be enough to know that the consequent was true. And in a true conditional statement, if we knew that the con in order for the antecedent to be true, the consequent has to be true. So it's a necessary condition for the antecedent. Now that's a lot, um, but let's look at a very simple conditional statement that I think illustrates this well. So this conditional statement is if I have $5, then I have at least $4. So we said that in a true conditional statement, and this is an example, if, you, if I have $5, then I must have at least $4, right? That's true. 
And we said that the antecedent is a sufficient condition for the consequent. So this conditional statement is true. And the antecedent is, I have $5. If it's true that I have at least $5, then that's enough to know that I have at least $4. We wouldn't need any other information to know that I have at least $4. And then we look at the consequent. The consequent here is, I have at least $4. And the consequent is said to be a necessary condition for the antecedent. So you must have at least $4 in order to have $5. So that shows us that the consequent there is necessary. Having at least $4 is necessary for having $5. We'll get a bunch of practice with that in class. All right, so those are the nine types of non-arguments. Now let's look at some practice passages and try to determine if they're arguments and if they're, or if they're non-arguments, and if they are non-arguments, what kind of non-arguments, which kind of the nine are they? So the first uh, practice passage, water is abundant over most of the Earth's surface, and within the temperature range usually encountered there, it is liquid. Water also is a powerful solvent. Consequently, water is an excellent medium for the chemical processes of living systems. It is hard to imagine life having any other basis than water. Now we see in this passage consequently, so uh, we should probably suspect that the part that comes after consequently, since consequently is a conclusion indicator word, will be the conclusion. So the conclusion would be water is an excellent medium for having chemical processes for the chemical processes of living systems. Now we want to ask ourselves, do the rest of, does the rest of the information in the passage give us a reason to believe that it's an excellent medium for the chemical processes of living systems? And we see the other information is water is abundant over most of the Earth's surface, and in the temperature range encountered there, it's liquid. And water is also a powerful solvent, so it can dissolve chemicals. So if there's an abundant liquid around and that liquid dissolves, chemicals, that would make it uh, an excellent medium for the chemical processes of living systems. So we see here that this is actually an argument. There's that relate that inferential link between premises and conclusion, meaning there are statements here that give us reason to believe one of the other statements. Let's look at example number two. So Example number two, Karl Marx believed that the key to human history was class conflict. According to Marx's theory, the bourgeoisie are locked in an inevitable conflict with the proletariat. This bitter struggle can end only when, the mem only when members of the working class unite in revolution and throw off their chains of bondage. The result will be a classless society, one free of exploitation, in which everyone will work according to their abilities and receive according to their needs. Ah, sounds great. Uh, so, is this an argument or is it a non-argument? Uh, there's a lot of big vocabulary in there. Your eyes might be bouncing off the page right now, but you don't need to understand a lot of this to figure out whether it's an argument or a non-argument and what type of non-argument it is. So look right at the beginning. Karl Marx believed. This is going to be a report, right? It's a report on what Karl Marx believed. He, he believed that this was the way that history has been and the way that history will play out. So this is a report on Karl Marx's view of history. Uh, none of the statements give us reason to believe another statement. This is just a report on Marx's view. All right, so the third passage. There are numerous ways to study non-human animals. One method is to observe a group and describe either by taking notes or speaking into a tape recorder as completely as possible everything that occurs. Another technique is to follow one focal animal describing everything it does. Still another frequently used method involves making observations of a focal animal at precise intervals. 
All right, if this was going to be an argument, then it seems like the conclusion would be the first statement. There are numerous ways to study non-human animals, but that seems like it would be a weird thing to try to prove, right? Uh, it seems pretty obvious that there would be lots of ways to study animals. So it's probably not going to be an argument. But now we have to figure out what kind of non-argument it is. So uh, the first sentence says there are numerous ways, and then the rest of the passage gives us examples of those ways, right? One method, observe the group. Another technique is to follow one focal animal. Another technique is uh, making observations of a focal animal at precise in intervals. Um, so this enumerates or illustrates the different ways that uh, people can study non-human animals. So this is going to be an illustration. Illustrations, recall, provide us with examples. All right, fourth example passage. If its ion engine operates as planned, its huge solar panel remains deployed and undamaged, and its xenon energy source is not exhausted, then the Dawn spacecraft will reach both Vesta and Ceres, large asteroids in the belt between Mars and Jupiter, and science, scientists will gather information about the formation of planets, whether Ceres has a buried ocean of fresh water, and whether vestiges of life lurk beneath its icy surface. Whew, that's a mouthful. One thing we notice about this passage right off the bat, it's just one sentence, right? Just one long sentence. Now, a single sentence can contain an argument, but we should be suspicious. Another reason that makes us suspicious that this is not an argument is we see right at the beginning we get this word if. So we know that there's going to be at least one conditional statement, but now we have to see how big is that single conditional statement, and it turns out this whole passage is just one conditional statement. So if a whole bunch of stuff happens, then a whole bunch of other stuff will happen. There'll be examples like this in the homework and on the test. You'll just get very long conditional statements where it says if a number of things happen, then a number of other things will happen. And recall, this passage isn't saying either of these things will happen, but or any of these things will happen, but it is saying if the first group happens, then the second group will happen. So this is going to be a conditional statement and a non-argument. All right, number five. Education in the United States is a system in crisis. Compared to their Asian and European counterparts, American students are poor academic performers, especially in the sciences and in mathematics. Despite having received an education, millions of adults are functionally and culturally illiterate. Educational funding has been cut dramatically, and many school facilities are in dangerous states of disrepair. All right, so we're trying to figure out if this is an argument or non-argument. Now, this passage is about education in the United States, right? That's the, the, the main topic of this passage. So if there's going to be a conclusion here, then the first sentence would be the conclusion, because that's what tells us, look, education in the United States, it's having, it's having problems. It's a system in crisis. Now, does the rest of the passage give us reason to believe that? Next sentence says, compared to their Asian and European counterparts, American students are poor academic performers, especially in sciences and in mathematics. That seems to me to provide some reason for thinking that education in the, in the United States is a system in crisis. The next sentence, despite having received an education, millions of adults are functionally and culturally illiterate. That's not a good thing for uh, education in the United States. Furthermore, educational funding has been cut dramatically not good for education in the United States, and many school facilities are in dangerous states of disrepair. That again tells us that uh, education in the United States is a system in crisis. So all of these are reasons to believe that first statement. So this is going to be an argument. There's that inferential link between premises and conclusion. The, uh, the first sentence this passage is trying to prove with all the rest of the statements.
All right, the last example we'll do together before the quiz questions. So, nicotine is addictive because its chemical structure is so similar to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and once inside the brain, it unlocks several other chemicals. One of these chemicals is dopamine, which produces a highly pleasant sensation. Another is adrenaline, which increases alertness. Yet a third is serotonin, which improves one's mood. When people are deprived of these chemicals, they naturally want more, and this leads to addiction. All right, so if this was going to be an argument, then we would think that the conclusion here would be nicotine is addictive. We would think that might be the conclusion because of this word because. Because is a premise indicator word if it occurs in an argument. But we're wondering if this is an argument. So first, let's ask ourselves, is that conclusion controversial? Well, it might have been, uh, and it was for a long time, um, whether nicotine was actually addictive or not. Um, but now it's much less controversial. Thankfully, we have, we've been getting the results of lots of the science, and uh, it's really clear that nicotine is addictive, and most people know that. So, not very controversial. So we're probably not looking at an argument. If we're not looking at an argument, and we see that word because, we recall from when I was talking about explanations that we were probably looking at an explanation. So let's see, is this trying to explain how nicotine is addictive, or is it trying to prove that nicotine is addictive? So the next statement we get is, its chemical structure is so similar to the neurotransmitter acetylcholine that once inside the brain, it unlocks several other chemicals. Then it gives us some other chemicals that it unlocks that we really like, and when we're deprived of those chemicals, we want more, and that leads to addiction. So this passage seems to be telling us how nicotine is addictive, how that works. Um, it's not trying to prove that it's addictive, it's trying to explain why it's addictive. So this passage will be an explanation, not an argument. All right, so hopefully that explanation of the different types of non-arguments and what distinguishes them from actual arguments was helpful and going through these examples was helpful because now it's on you. There are three quiz questions. The first question, is the following passage an argument or not? The farther away we look in the distance, the further back we look in time. This fact allows us to see what parts of the universe look like in the distant past. For example, if we look at a galaxy that is one billion light years away, its light has taken one billion years to reach us, which means we are seeing it as it looked one billion years ago. Now, you don't need to, if this is an argument, uh, tell me it's a, if it's an tell me it's an argument. If it's a non-argument, you don't need to determine what type of non-argument it is. You would just tell me it's a non-argument. So in your notes for quiz question one, write whether this is an argument or non-argument. Quiz question two is the following passage an argument or not? There are two types of pension plan. In a defined contribution plan, a company contributes a specific amount of money, often based on profits, to a fund owned by its employees. In a defined benefit plan, the company promises to make specific lifetime payments to its employees when they retire. The payments depend on each employee's pay at retirement, years of service, and expected lifespan. So again, just tell me whether this is an argument or non-argument. Write that in your notes, and when you open the quiz, tell me the answer. Finally, quiz question three. Here I'm going to ask you a couple things. Is the following passage an argument? And if it's not an argument, what type of non-argument is it? Here's the passage. If growth can no longer be counted on to provide for all the major wants, private and public, of a society, or to sustain all the peripheral members of a society at a level that keeps a lid on mutinous outbreaks, especially in congested urban centers, then, some specification of a nation's most serious needs 
its social priorities, and some direction as to how goods are to be allocated among society's members are needed. So again, if that's an argument, all you have to tell me is it's an argument. If it's a non-argument, then you'll have to specify what type of non-argument it is. So you can look at the list down here to the left, and you would tell me which type of non-argument that is, if it's a non-argument. All right, see you next time.